we this session is about an hour but could be less so we'll see how long it takes and um i was asked to talk about frailty and deprescribing and i was also asked to do some kind of case well i was asked about case studies which i think meant you were going to bring them but i brought one so my plan is to talk through the case give you some opportunities to contribute through menti or in the chat as we go through uh, ask any questions you want and if it triggers questions about your own patients again feel free to ask them and we'll try and finish by half past one and emma do you want me to ask them as they go along or do you want me to leave them to i the can end read them you? in the chatter so i will be fine to just sort of manage it no so, uh, but i'll ask for help if i need it if that's okay so hopefully you can see my slides and so what i'm going to cover uh, in this session is i'm going to base this everything on a case study we're going to think about how you know if someone's frail. Then we're going to think about why frail people um, are particularly uh, have problems with medicines. I'm going to talk about geriatric syndromes and those how they can be uh, exacerbated by medicines. I'm going to then look at polypharmacy and how we prioritise medicines for deprescribing and frailty. Make sure we thought about stopping medicines with withdrawal reactions. Then we're going to talk about life expectancy and can you predict this and um, then think about whether we should continue or stop preventative medicines in patients with frailty and we're going to try and emphasize holistic and patient stroke care or focused care but as always we're learning the prescribers and the deprescriber perspective so we always start with the science uh, and the patient sort of is tagged on at the end but of course all of this should be presaged by it's a completely evident well not completely, but a largely evidence-free area. And so a lot of what we do has to be based on what the patient wants as much as possible. So, first of all, you are a, a bright bunch of clinicians. How do you know if someone's frail? What do you do to tell, decide if they're frail? Uh, if you go into the mentee, you should find that there is a free text um, opportunity for you to start contributing and some people already have so I'll just take other people's answers out so you can tell me how you know if someone is frail. I'll give you sort of 30 seconds to write your, your answer. It might just be looking at them, looking at an old lady like me and thinking you look quite frail or it might be all sorts of other things and I'm interested to know what you think. Emma there is no way in hell that you look frail I'll be honest. <laughs> That's true. I was making a joke. Oh, don't but worry. I thought, I thought, I, thought I would give that you a compliment you back. that quickly. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. I give probably another... look the frailer one today on my, on my deathbed, but that's fine. <laughs> I'm going to give everyone another 15 seconds to submit their answers, and then we'll have a look at what you said. And the link is definitely working, because I've double-checked it. Brilliant. So we've got about 11 contributions, which is great. 12. Thank you very much. Any more? These look brilliant. OK, so the sorts of things you've said, apparently, if I press the space bar, I don't know if this will work. AI will sort this out for me, but it didn't seem to. So some people uh, just look at patients and think they're a bit shaky and slow and elderly, which is a good suggestion just to look at them. But some people say you can't just look until you talk to them and assess them. Somebody suggested a blood test. Quite a few people have suggested frailty scores and indexes. Um, some people have talked about them being unable to look after themselves, which is great. People starting to have falls, they can't manage, they can't consent. All of these things are really great answers. So it sounds like already you're totally uh, on the case. Um, uh, also, anyone who's missed the code, um, Nora, uh, you can just click the link in the chat, uh, which will take you straight there. So brilliant. So loads of great uh, suggestions about how you can tell if someone's frail. So we need something to do that's nice and quick and easy uh, in the clinic. So let's look at that. So first of all, is anybody else worried when they look at their car about driving long distances? This is not actually my car, but it is a 52. So it is 22 years old. I don't drive it very far now. And the reason I don't drive it very far is because it's frail. And sort of what I mean by that is it's still working 
And particularly if it was a good car in the first place, which mine was, it's probably still working, which I guess is a great analogy for people. Uh, if you were quite a good in the, physiologically in the first place, you're probably still going into your 80s and 90s. But all the parts are old. So at any time, so, you know, these cars, you have to drive them carefully. You don't lend them to somebody because if you do, they'll drive it badly and something will go. And once one thing starts to go, everything else does. And you sort of need to treat these cars with kid gloves. So away from the car analogy, frail people, I guess, are a bit like that. As your answer suggests, you can't always tell if someone's frail just by looking at them. Frailty has an official definition. It's a multi-system syndrome of decreased physiological reserve. Like my old car, the exhaust is on its last legs, the carburettor is on its last legs, but it's still all going. But if an acute event happens to my car or to a frail person, they are both more vulnerable uh, to something catastrophic happening uh, than if you're not frail. So frail people, as we know, are going along and then something happens and then there's a step down in their condition and then they can't manage so well or they become much more unwell. So I've had a question, Emma, if you don't mind me asking quickly. Go for it. Um, that's come through directly. So from your diagram, are we to assume that all patients who are disabled are frail? No, I haven't done the diagram yet. So shall I do the diagram first? And then... Sorry, I, I, no, I, just, I, that's the thing. I think someone just I sent it to me as a text saying, are we to assume that everyone who's frail is disabled no, is frail? No, absolutely is not. So um, when we are perhaps fit and healthy and relatively young, everything's working well. We have a lot of reserve. So we might have kidney reserve or brain reserve or heart reserve. So if, if we have a bit of a drop in function, we still we still go, we can still manage. Frailty is about the drops in reserve. So for example, you might just be still cognitively normal, but you might have reduced brain volume, some small vessel disease, so that if you then, for example, took a sedative drug, you might be more susceptible than a uh, robust person. So frailty is about loss of reserve, but it that frail people aren't necessarily disabled. Uh, but frailty can, lead to disability and once if you are disabled and you have less mobility and you have um uh so less mobility for example you don't eat as well you don't exercise so much you can become more frail so frailty is in itself just a loss of physiological reserve uh, but it doesn't necessarily it doesn't mean you're disabled and it can be um Obviously, it, it, it independently and strongly predicts morbidity and mortality, but frail people may not have disability or disease. I mean, it's just, again, it's associated with multimorbidity. Does that make sense? So it's a loss of reserve. So if something goes wrong, it can be catastrophic and you might not come back from it, but it isn't necessarily disability. Absolutely. It so makes what, a lot we, of sense. what we don't want to do as uh, clinicians is make this worse with drugs so that people then go into the disabled or the particularly we don't want to, them to go into the death category. And the other point is that frail people don't have to be old and they don't have to have multimorbidity, but increasing age and increasing multimorbidity is associated with increasing frailty. That makes sense? So you can be frail in, in your 30s or 40s or even a child, you can be frail. Please, anybody else who wants to ask questions, stick them in the chat. You're very welcome. Now, I think frail, we always think of frailty as being physical. And you'll all think of patients that you have who have just just a wasting away a bit. They've got thinner. They've lost weight. They're tired and weak. They've slowed down a lot. They're not very active. And uh, you can also see in frail patients these things called geriatric syndromes were not really organ specific disease, but all the body functions start to fail, incontinence, falls, general functional decline, delirium. These are all sort of associated with frailty. Um, but I think you should also it's also quite helpful to think of other types of frailty, such as psychological frailty. You're less resilient, perhaps cognitive frailty. Um, cognitive impairment, uh, impairment with physical frailty in the absence of dementia, 
and also social frailty. We all know that the old patients living on their own at home maybe don't have any social support or family. And so they've lost the social resources and behaviours that are important for their social needs. So you can think often people who are physically frail can manage much better for longer if they have good social resilient networks. So I asked you how you knew if someone is frail. Here's two men. They look very similar. One is frail and one isn't. So how can we tell? Uh, we can tell by various things. So I've mentioned already that frailty is partly about not being able to move so well. But I'm not going to recommend that you in your pharmacy uh, clinics start doing gait speed and timed up and go tests because I think that that it does that become, goes beyond what I think we can reasonably do in routine care. But gait speed is basically how far can somebody walk four meters and a timed up and go test is how quickly can they get up, walk a distance, come back and sit down. And as you get more frail, those things slow down. But I think things we can all use quite easily in clinical practice, particularly are the PRISMA 7 questionnaire and the clinical frailty score. And at the end of this talk, I've given you a resource pack with links to all these things that I'll share with Chandni after the presentation. And I'm going to just touch on the electronic frailty index and why we sort of shouldn't use it, but we probably do. So the PRISMA 7 questionnaire, I think, is so easy. We could do it in two seconds. Um, it's easy just to quickly answer these questions. And if the respondent has three or more yeses, uh, this indicates an increased risk of frailty. And so we're not making a firm diagnosis, but then we can use this information in our practice to be thinking about whether we should be being cautious or uh, worrying about their medication. We use this in the hospital, and I think this is also very useful in primary care, is just to think where somebody is on the clinical frailty scale. Do they range from very fit, robust, active, energetic and motivated all the way through to uh, becoming vulnerable, uh, becoming mildly frail, moderately, severely frail, etc., and terminal illness. And frailty it predicts mortality, but it's not the same as terminal illness, and we're going to talk about that a bit later. The e-frailty index is worth a mention because it may be, I don't know, is it on all your patient records? Do you have that as part of uh, EMIS or any of the records? Because it's basically electronically calculated. I think it's a tool that we can use to, and you've got to press a button to calculate it, but it means you have to go in to go and calculate it, but it is there. You can use it. So that is possibly worth, it's gone, said Linian. And the reason it's probably gone, Linian, is not really meant to be used as a clinical tool. It's more of a population stratification measures. And what it does is it takes, um, looks for 36 deficits, and most of those are multimorbidities. So the, there's a debate as to how well this judges frailty. Um, and basically it adds up the number of those 36 deficits you have, and then it gives you a score between naught and one. And you can see that basically uh, gives you a stratification of how frail you are. But it's really meant for population studies and maybe allocation of funding and those kind of things rather than for use in the clinic. So my suggestion is that you could use these to get a ballpark feeling for whether someone is frail or not quite easily in the clinic. So let's have a look at our case and introduce you to this um, young man. He's 87. Uh, he's come to the clinic because he has urinary incontinence at night. He's not really complaining of this, but his wife is because she's his main carer. He, um, on a further assessment, he tell, she tells you that he walks a short distance with a stick, but he's got decreasingly able to mobilise and he's having several falls. She has to help him. She has to prompt him with dressing and help him with showering. And he's continent of urine in the day, but not at night. He's got a past history of vascular dementia and he has poor cognitive function and he's sometimes aggressive, particularly if he has a urine infection or a virus, gets a little bit more confused and then he will lash out and all the things like walking sticks have to be hidden away. Otherwise, he's violent to his wife. So do you think he's frail? I'm trying to remember what my next menti question is because I don't um, remember which one I. Uh, what's next? I'm just checking what my. I don't think this is a menti question. So is he frail? Uh, who thinks he's frail from this? What do you think his Prisma Seven score is?
Anyone who can be first to give us a Prisma 7 score? Mitesh says yes. Anyone got a score? We don't really need to score him, really, to think that things are starting to break down for this young man, do we? Everyone says yes. Anyone got a score for me out of seven? Well, we could work it out together if you wanted to. So Nora says seven. He's older than 85, correct? Absolutely. Yes. Male, two. Mm -hmm. Health problems, probably. It's difficult to know. We haven't got a real health assessment, but certainly uh, he is limited in his activities. He needs regular help. Uh, he stays at home. Uh, he, but he has got. So I guess he, he's yes, he's got someone close to him to help, and he regularly uses a stick. So I agree, he's seven. So the Prisma questionnaire sort of cements in our mind that we're right. We're to worry about this guy being frail, and he's quite bundled to be honest. What do you think his clinical frailty scale score is? Anyone want to stick a number in the chat? Raghad says six. Does anyone disagree? I'm six. About six. Lynette says six to seven. Chadney says six to about six. I think that seems right, doesn't it? He's moderately fairly, he's, he needs help with all outside activities and he's obviously got his wife as his carer. He needs help with bathing, bathing, mineral assistance, which is queuing with dressing, but he's not quite completely dependent. So I think six, maybe moving to seven is a really good assessment. So do, so but hopefully you feel that having these really quick, easy scales just can get you in your brain into that place where you're thinking about this patient and this sort of degree of frailty and on top of our own just sort of basic judgment. So now we need to think what the implications of the frailty is for us as uh, clinicians, um, particularly with a special um, focus on medicines. So next Menti question for you is are you concerned about any of his medications? This is his list in frailty. So please um, have a, I'll read them out and that'll give you a minute just to type in the chat any concerns, in the mentee, any concerns you have. Are you worried about amlodipine, aspirin, atorvastatin, bendroflumathiazide, cocodamol, lactulose, lanzoprazole, Chadden is not nodding at all of them. Uh, risperidone, <laughs> oxybutynin, tolteridine, zopiclone. Anybody worried about any of those for this frail man with his incontinence, uh, his uh, aggression, his dementia? People are going in the chat already. The uh, chat or menti is great, but whichever you prefer, guys. I've given you a menti to, um, uh, hopefully I can move it on to type into but uh your uh ideas coming in the chat are great too so uh Mitesh and Lillian are worried about the anticholinergic burden score which I think is really important mm. Poonam's worried about amlodipine increasing his risk of falls Lynette is worried about the risperidone with the zopiclone which I think is very fair and risk of falls anyone worried about any of these drugs with his incontinence his nocturnal incontinence uh, I like the uh, different ways that you've tackled this. Anticholinergics, Damglyph, I think that's mm. dam drugs, diuretics and the aspirin, particularly potentially affecting his kidneys. I don't think he's on antidepressants, but he is on antipsychotics. A few people have asked whether the statin's necessary, and we're going to touch on that in a minute. Um, these are all some. So you've only had one second to look at the case, and you've already come up with some great suggestions for things that we should be worried about. So I'm now going to start moving through things um, just one at a time. But before I do that, I just want to sort of give an overview of some of the issues we should be worried about in patients with frailty. So patients with frailty have decreased physiological reserve. 
This means that their pharmacokinetics may be altered, so they may be less good at metabolizing and excreting drugs, but also less good at activating them and absorbing them. So they may not get the dose of drug we intend, and we all know that we need to reduce doses in older patients. They may also have pharmacodynamic changes. And for example, you've already suggested they may be more susceptible to the antihypertensive effects of amlodipine or the sedative effects of zopiclone. So they may be more susceptible to adverse effects. Very commonly, patients with frailty also uh, are perhaps even undertreated. So they have a lot of omissions in their treatment because they're frail and maybe people don't then think about making sure they're on the all the guideline based treatments and that may or may not be OK. You probably know that they're not included in clinical trials, pretty much it never. Uh, so there's a considerable lack of any clinical trial evidence. And also the care and treatment priorities for the patients, how they want to be cared for. Uh, I've said already, frail patients are like a dodgy car. Uh, dodgy is the wrong word, a frail car. You need to treat them with care. And so any alterations you make might upset the equilibrium and decompensate them in a way they might not recover from. And also frail patients uh, tend to have multimorbidity and multimorbid patients tend to have polypharmacy and polypharmacy can worsen frailty. Um, frailty obviously can lead to polypharmacy. And there's a lot of risk in these patients of drug disease interactions and drug drug interactions. And we're going to think about all of those for our patient. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. So the next thing I'm going to think about are the sort of geriatric syndromes of incontinence and um, loss of sort of functional decline, falls, uh, cognitive impairment. So our patient is particularly concerned about um, urine or his wife is particularly concerned that at night he's incontinent of urine. And I just want to put at the front of our minds the fact that often in frail patients, physical and social support may be more helpful than medication. We know that whatever medication we're going to give a frail patient, we're at risk of decompensating them. So the first thing we should do is think about how we can support the patient in other ways and decrease their perhaps their social frailty. So some suggestions here might be uh, incontinence support and you might want to get your district nurse involved pads or nappies for the patient at night or a convene. Maybe he can't, why is he incontinent at night? And I'll think about that in a minute, but maybe he can't walk to the toilet. So does he need more mobility support? Is a stick good enough? Does he need a zimmer or a relator or some handrails? Um, do we need to get occupational therapy in? His, the problem might be his poor wife who's got to look after him all day and is now being woken up three times at night. Maybe it doesn't matter if he can have a pad and he's incontinent, but maybe he's waking his wife. So what respite is, does she get? Does he have carers for his physical needs so she doesn't have to do it? If he's aggressive, does he need some behavioural support? Is there something else that we could do? Could we get him in for daycare or get him tired out so he sleeps better? Uh, or get uh, some of play, uh, charities like Age UK or Alzheimer's involved. None of those are meant to be definitive, but these are just, I think for frail patients, we should really be thinking around, thinking outside the box and outside medicines as much as we can, because as soon as we start to use medicines, we potentially go to decompensate them and make them more unwell. Doesn't mean they can't have medicines, but we need to think about other um uh, the multidisciplinary approach and potentially our social prescribers may be helping us with this. I don't want to add anything. I'm trying to put the patient at the front of the consultation, even though I'm now going to talk only about pharmacology. Well, I think social prescribers are definitely the way forward going forward. So your continence clinics as well that are going to be there as well, which will be making uh, support on that front. Um, Lillian's written a very uh, avid point following on from that. So is there funding for continent support in non-complex patients who are not housebound? Because I haven't found it in Wandsworth yet. Some other areas in South London have them. So that's where a continence clinic and a continence referral to a continence team would be worth going and considering so that you can go and um, assess, they can assess what that patient's needs are. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be housebound. It's just the fact that they are having those continence issues uh, on that front um, to be assessed. Um, and I think, oh, 
Peter's going to say you were about to ask about social prescribers, but it would have been good, but you beat me to it. So Peter's added that in, bless him. Um, so I think that we're all kind of on the same page on that front. And sometimes even the psychological support can make a big difference for when someone's going through all of this as well. Um, so for the wife, for the patient in itself, that's something that we do need to think about because as you can imagine, and I like to say the word mature, as we mature like fine wines do rather than getting old, but as we do mature, it's it's very difficult to not be in the same position as you were, say, 20 odd years ago, where you were able to be fully independent and competent, do all of these things. So sometimes depression, anxiety can creep in as well. These are all very good points. So I suppose my, my the key point I want to make here is that it's probably not all about medicines in a patient who's frail. Um. I don't know, Lillian, um, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert on bowel and bladder teams, but if anybody else knows, please write in the chat. Um, not a self-referral, you'll need to refer them directly. So there is a bladder and bowel team, I'm sure, in uh, Wandsworth, but you just need you need to refer rather than self-refer. Yeah, this patient's probably not going to self-refer. In fact, this patient's wife was a um, healthcare assistant so she's very good at managing his incontinence however um, she's getting fed up okay moving on now to think about uh, incontinence and medication and whether this patient should have um, more drugs so um, first of all, I'm going to try and sort of think about lack of efficacy I'm then going to think about drug disease interactions and how his drugs potentially could be making his incontinence worse and could we de-prescribe, which is what we all love to do. Um, uh, then thinking also about his uh, predisposition to adverse effects because of his frailty and also a bit about multimorbidity. So the uh, do we have the right diagnosis? So the first thing I think whenever we look at a problem, urinary incontinence, do we have the right diagnosis? So here um, uh, he's been started on medication, for example, oxybutynin for urge incontinence. But this guy is not, con not incontinent in the day. He's only incontinent at night. So we do need to make sure that uh, he's had some kind of a medical assessment. Has he got anything that could be contributing like prostate disease or infection or constipation? Could his medication be driving some of his incontinence? And also, we've said already, uh, he's got poor mobility, potentially irregular hydration and diet. That might be an issue and social factors. So um, I think that uh, potentially, for example, we've talked, we've mentioned he's on sedation. Perhaps he's not waking up at night to go to the toilet or is less aware. It's affecting his mobility. So we do need to be sure we understand why he's incontinent before we think about medication. So could his medication be causing urinary incontinence? I went through his medication list and thought about, and I will just sort of say that this is actually a fictitious patient based on uh, some that I've seen. So he's not an identifiable person. But uh, I think the first thing that we all should do as medicine specialists is make sure that some of his medicine isn't actually the cause of his urinary incontinence. So there are some obvious things here and then there are some surprises. So the obvious thing, I guess, is the fact he's on a diuretic, uh, a thiazide diuretic, and that causes naturesis, so loss of sodium and water. So it would make sense that that might increase urinary flow and could trigger incontinence. Perhaps slightly less well known is that amlodipine also causes a naturesis. And that's why when we're treating hypertension, uh, amlodipine and bendroflumothiazide don't have any combination benefit together. Um, because both of them work through the same mechanisms, naturesis and, of course, vasodilatation. So could we review his antihypertensives? And we'll do that in a minute. He's obviously uh, at risk of constipation and sedation from his cocodamol. So could we get his codeine dose down? He's on a massive dose of codeine. Um, he's obviously sedated at night by his risperidone and zopiclone. Uh, which might reduce his awareness and mobility. So could we do something about that? And he's also on two bladder drugs. He's on tolteridine, uh, which is an alpha um, blocker, which could um, reduce his bladder outlet resistance and is good for his prostate to, to increase urinary flow uh, related to his prostate, but could, of course, 
increase in continence uh, and his oxybutynin is to treat urge incontinence, but of course this is going to increase his anticholinergic burden, we'll talk about in a minute, could cause retention with overflow um, incontinence, which is why it's important to get a medical assessment as well for this patient, and with the anticholinergic burden could worsen his confusion. We know he's continent in the day, but he's not continent at night, so that might be an issue. So I think our job as medicine specialists is, first of all, to think whether his medication is driving his disease or his symptoms. The second thing is that this patient hasn't just got um, incontinence. He's also got vascular dementia with aggression. And he's also had fall, so he's got multimorbidity. And if we look at his medicines, I think some people have already commented on this. He, the falls could be caused by a lot of his medicines, by his anticholinergic burden score, by his sedative drugs, uh, by his uh, hypotensive drugs. So we need to be aware in a frail patient that our uh, uh, intended good drugs might also uh, increase the, because um, the, they're, they're frail, they might decompensate other areas of their, of their function and their geriatric syndromes. I'm sure you all are highly skilled at calculating the anticholinergic burden. I really like the ACB calculator. And for this patient, we have an anticholinergic burden of eight. And this is probably the one audience I don't really need to talk about that with. Um, uh, as soon as you have a score of three or more, you're at higher risk of confusion, which he has, falls, which he has, and death, which at the moment we don't want him to have. So we need to think about reducing his anticholinergic burden. And you can see this, talk about these geriatric syndromes, the anticholinergic burden worsens them all. So frail patients are going to be much more susceptible to the risks of a high anticholinergic burden than robust patients. So what are we going to stop? We've got to prioritise because we can't stop. Well, we can stop them all. So if you go to your mentee, you'll find the, I've given you the medicines alphabetically. Sorry, I've spelt the Torvastatin wrong, but you have the opportunity to rank them. Now, which ones are you going to stop first? And again, I'll try and give you a minute to, to rank. Looking at Chadney, when she's ranked them, I shall I will uh, pull the mentee up. Okay, well, that doesn't mean you all have to have finished, but I'll just get the Mentimeter up and we'll see how many people have done it. Only three people have done it so far. So shall I give you another 30 seconds to rank and submit? It's quite we'll... fiddly, actually, because it decided to move every so often when I pressed the other one. I was like, oh, no, I want you there and just moving things around. It's a bit fiddly, so yes, sorry. And there's so many drugs. It's a bit like real life, isn't it? Trying to manage really... multiple medicines for patients when it's so complicated. It reminded me of my dosset boxes when I used to make dosset boxes in community pharmacy and trying to pop them all in and then one would just pop over there. Uh, and I'm like, I don't want you over there. I want you back over there. Okay, I'll just give you another few more seconds. Be good to get a South London consensus for this patient. So I've only got three. Anybody else want to rank? Honestly, it's a safe space. You can't go wrong with it. Well, so we don't know who you are as well, so. Add in random ones if you want to. I think we stick with the three. 
Oh, oh six we people. Got six. Oh, there brilliant. you go. Thank you, everybody, for seven. submitting. We've got seven now. So it's gone up. Great. So we've got um, the top one to stop. Oh, it's going. Eight. It's still, still shuffling. We've sort of started with Tolteridine, which is uh, his um, prostate treatment, and his diuretic, which sounds very sensible. We've also got uh, oxybutynin and doxycycline high up there. Uh, I, I think that it's interesting, isn't it, that actually you've kept the aspirin and the atorvastatin and the lactulose um, and the lansoprazole as his gastro protection is amlodipine. So you haven't stopped his preventative meds. You've decided as southwest London that we're going to try and stop some of this, reduce his anticholinergic burden and stop the sedatives. I like that. That's going to be my approach too. So well done and thank you for taking part. Feel free I still to find end. it very funny that Zopiclone doesn't have an anticholinergic burden. I guess it doesn't block cholinergic receptors. I know, but it's stupid. You'd think it has more problems than anything else. But just not through the cholinergic system. Just through not the cholinergic I just think it's stupid. But that's just a personal comment from me. Unexpected, definitely. So um this is uh did we we, we all have a lot of um expertise now in de-prescribing but one of the challenges I think is um, where to start especially if someone's on a lot of drugs and we think they're all going to be harmful so I stole this from the British Geriatric Society silver book on geriatric syndromes and we all know geriatricians are very good at cross stopping everything so I thought I'd see what they suggested and they suggest you ascertain all drugs the patient's currently taking and the reasons for each one uh, which we always do, consider overall risk of drug-induced harm. And we've done that. We've said he's at quite a lot of risk of drug-induced harm. And so we want quite an intense de-prescribing intervention for this patient. Uh, we then have to think about um, its uh, current or future benefit compared with current or future harm. And then they suggest we prior prioritise, where do we start? We prioritise drugs for discontinuation that have the lowest benefit harm ratio and the lowest likelihood of adverse withdrawal reactions or disease rebound syndromes and then stop drugs and monitor and uh, tweak. So that's the hardest bit when we have a resource strapped healthcare service. At St George's, we've developed this thing called the stopping by indication tool. And again, I'll share this with you guys. But one of the th trouble is that we all know that there is poor evidence to support deprescribing. So it's helpful to try and think generally, why is the drug being prescribed? Because that then helps you generally to think about the risks of stopping and a possible approach. So I'm going to ignore the short term drugs, but we must always remember a short course has to have a stop date. But think about, for example, a lot of drugs are just for symptom control. So we can stop the drugs if it's not clear if they're working or the symptoms have gone away. And we're, we're monitoring for a symptom flare. If the drug is preventative, like the aspirin and the atorvastatin, um, we might think that now the benefits as the life expectancy is reducing are less and the burden of treatment might be more. So we might want to stop, but we're always going to be wary that there's going to be a risk of disease occurrence or recurrence in the future. Where we have a disease like diabetes or heart failure, we might want to stop the drug, for example, if the diagnosis was incorrect or there was overtreatment or the medicines have been ineffective or superseded or the condition has changed. And we have to watch out in our monitoring for the disease control worsening. And also we might be at risk of them exacerbating the disease. I'm going to ignore physiological replacement for the moment and just highlight prescribing cascade. Again, we all know that drugs, for example, lansoprazole are prescribed as gastro protection for aspirin. So if aspirin is stopped as part of our plan, we must make sure we stop the cascade therapy as well. Otherwise, patients just get left on these drugs sort of long term. So it's really helpful to think why the patient's on the drug um, for uh, to uh, uh, in general rather than for the specific, uh, as well as for the specific indication when we're thinking about stopping. So how are we going to prioritise dr our um, drugs for de-prescribing in this gentleman? I've added in now the benefits of the drugs because we've already considered the harms of his drug list. 
And we can see that the sort of alphabetically, bizarrely, the top four are all about prevention. He's got vascular dementia. So he's got vascular disease, maybe mini strokes, small vessel disease, maybe he's had a stroke. And so he's on preventative medicine, a secondary prevention to try and prevent that from worsening. But most of the rest of the drugs are for symptoms. So pain relief, uh, incontinence and urinary symptoms, aggression, insomnia. And then he's on lactulose and lanzoprazole as cascade drugs for the constipating effects of opioids and for gastroprotection for his aspirin. So we, it was suggested that we should stop the drugs where the benefit, um, the benefit harm rate, the, the, with the, what, what did it say, the lowest benefit harm ratio and the least risk of a withdrawal reaction or disease um, uh, exacerbation when we stop the drugs. So stopping symptoms drugs feels like a safe place to start. So I, you guys started with the tolteridine to stop, and I think that's really interesting. Um, I, I guess my concern for this guy was that actually he might have uh, prostatism. And if we did stop his tolteridine and left him on his oxybutynin, he might go into urinary retention. So my thought was that we would stop his oxybutynin first as a very anticholinergic drug and just see how he went, particularly as he's continent in the day, uh, but incontinent at night, and we're not sure that the diagnosis of urinary urgency is right. And that was my suggestion. But I'd also like your suggestion of tolteridine. I was anxious about the risk of retention because I wasn't really aware of this degree of prostatism. So that was my thought, but I agree, let's stop one of the high anticholinergic urinary drugs. The other thing that I thought we could, it was an easy win, would be to tackle his cocodamol. Now, we don't know why, what, why he's taking it, so obviously we need to check before we do anything. But at the very least, we could split it into paracetamol and codeine. And at the very least, we could try and get the codeine dose down. Because he's there he's having that four times a day, two, four times a day. That's 240 milligrams, which is the top dose. And maybe he could have half that, five milligrams, 15 milligrams or eight milligrams of codeine at a time. Uh, he's also going to get tolerant and constipated, which might contribute to his um, uh, urine retention. So my suggestion is that we split that cocodamol into paracetamol and codeine, reduce the codeine dose and discourage use uh, and use the paracetamol regularly. And that might allow us to uh, uh, reduce the lactulose as a cascade drug, but there's no hurry to do that. We think it's got a low adverse burden. So those seem to be the easiest wins because they have potentially the lowest uh, benefit harm rate, the worst benefit harm ratio, and they have less risk of withdrawal reactions, although I appreciate that he's on an opioid and that is not easy, but I think we could at least reduce the dose. So risperidone and zopiclone are a bit more tricky because they are at risk, we have risks with those. Uh, we have to taper, we're going to have some more challenge in withdrawing those safely without causing withdrawal reactions. So I thought it'd be helpful just to review a little bit about um, antipsychotics for dementia and uh, zopiclone in dementia and the risk benefit. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with forest plots, but being a highly trained bunch of pharmacists, I expect you've got a vague idea what they are. And basically what these show is lots of different papers on the subject. So this looks at um, whether antipsychotics reduce agitation um, in patients with dementia. If the studies are to this side of the line, I've put favours the antipsychotic. And if it's to the other side of the line, they favour placebo. If they cross the line, it means no difference. These are what's called confidence intervals. But if they don't cross the line, it means there's a difference. And this is called a meta-analysis. So all these papers are put together and the overall result from the papers is shown as the black diamond at the bottom. So you can see that risperid or antipsychotics for dementia do slightly reduce agitation. But if we now look at the adverse effects, we can see overall they reduce, they increase sleepiness, they cause ex increased risk of extra pyramidal symptoms 
And there is a trend towards, although it's not significant because it's crossing the line, an increased risk of death. And we've also heard recently an association of antipsychotics with cardiovascular um, effects. So on balance, these seem to be drugs with a high risk of harm and relatively low likelihood of benefit. We've already mentioned all of the non-pharmacological things we could do for this man's aggression and agitation. So we need to think about deprescribing, but with antipsychotics um, and all the drugs with a dependency, we do need to think about doing that carefully because of the risk of withdrawal reactions. Um, antipsychotics are one of the five drugs that have guidelines um, in the Canadian deprescribing.org. And uh, this, I, I, I'm aware that I'm going to run out of time quite soon. I want to get onto life expectancy, but it's quite helpful in uh, don't, guiding. Don't worry about the time. You've got plenty of time. Don't worry. We can delay the le next session. It's not an issue. OK, um, so you can see that there, there is a good. Out this is great, isn't it? To have some guidelines and algorithms. And what you can see is that we can get the patients off risperidone. The first thing to consider uh, if they become aggressive again on the um uh, behavioural and psychological symptoms recur uh, is music therapy and behavioural management strategies, not more sedative drugs. Similarly, with Z drugs in frail patients like Zopiclone, um, there are two types of studies that we could look at. One is called observational studies, where we look at the risk of um, for here fractures and falls in patients taking Zopiclone versus patients not taking Zopiclone. These are observational studies, so they're not clinical trials. But you can see that uh, this favours control, this favours Z drugs. You can see that fractures and almost falls are more common uh, in patients taking Z drugs who are frail. There is one placebo controlled trial of Zopiclone for dementia and it does increase sleep duration and reduce wakening, but it causes even over 14 days worsening performance on cognitive function tests. So again, a drug likely to cause more harm than good and another drug that has a risk of withdrawal reactions. I don't know if anyone's looked at the Maudsley deprescribing guidelines, but these are brilliant, although very complicated for um, stopping uh, um, Zopiclone, benzodiazepines, antidepressants, opioids. It's all about looking at receptor occupancy and the dose, the, the dose reduction schedule, but I haven't got time to go into that now. But you can see that Z drugs have a whole range of um, withdrawal effects, some of which agitation, confusion, delirium, et cetera, might very be very harmful for our frail patient and these occur in 30 to 45 percent of patients stopping zopiclone the longer they're used and the higher dose the greater the risk of withdrawal so maybe for our patient we could taper him and see how we go and they suggest that you reduce um, the dose every one to two weeks by this much each time uh, so basically by 25 percent each time, well, it's not quite that, but you can see the schedule there. And uh, the most common side effect of Zopiclone withdrawal is insomnia. And so you should wait for that to settle before eat, at each dose step before you make the next reduction. But that's probably a whole another enormous topic um, to discuss. Does anyone want to comment on um, withdrawing? Uh, drugs of dependence and the challenges. Does anyone do that? Does anyone help patients through it? It's about doing it slow and steady. Hi, Emma. I think it's so quite a struggle. I would just be concerned with the why, which, or the care. If, if the patient is not sleeping well at night, would that cause a problem to them as well? Because they're going to have to wake up and look after the patient. So that is one thing that I will have to get the care on board. The other thing is if the patient as well, how perceptive they are to reducing the medication, because we, we are faced with quite a lot of resistance in reducing the dose of a um, sedative when it comes to patients most of the time. Lillian has a great point, work with the patient regarding the pace. I think it's about having a discussion with them, Hala, about the risks and benefits. So um, 
obviously insomnia is part of dementia there might be other options potentially for their sleeping difficulties but being on um zopiclone long term probably loses its effectiveness and then causes other problems like risk of falls, fracture, worsening confusion. So maybe it's about trying to negotiate totally. You can't do any of this without the agreement of the um, carer and the patient if he has capacity. But um, uh, if we don't, um, the, the, the likelihood is that these drugs are doing more harm than they are improving the insomnia. So it's about trying to just talk about that and seeing if they're willing to give it a go. And if they are to reduce slowly and steadily and be prepared not to go down further if the wife is just going crazy because he's awake, it's going to be tricky because we want him awake to go to the toilet so he's not incontinent, but we don't want him awake all night running up and down the hall, uh, although he probably can't do that because he's braille, uh, but keeping the wife awake. So it's very, it's, it's a very challenging balance and caring for these patients is tricky at any time. These are really good points. Uh, somebody suggested that, uh, Lillian suggested she had a patient been on Zopiclone for 20 years. It wasn't working anymore. It probably hadn't been working for 20 years, Lillian, to be honest. Um, and it's just, it's, I don't have an easy answer for sleep. I'm just, I'm talking about deprescribing today. We can maybe talk about, get, you have to get a sleep expert to talk about sleep. Um, um, I think I, I don't want to go on forever. I've still got plenty more that I could talk about, but I think it's worth us thinking about should we de-prescribe de his preventative medicine? And most of us were not keen to do this um, or that it was a low priority for us. Um, and so they are causing some of his side, potentially causing some of his effect, um, symptoms, potentially uh, having other risks such as GI bleeding, for example, in a patient who's frail. So what? how on earth do we tackle this? So there's loads of considerations. We have to sort of work out what our position is for the patient. Then we have to understand what the patient's and carer's positions are. And then we have to have a joint discussion and plan. And there's no absolute answer there. But the bit I would like to sort of get in before the end of my time is life expectancy. How well we predict it and then think a little bit of time about primary versus secondary prevention, et cetera. So you've got another question on your mentee. Um, this is an 87 year old man. Um, you've seen that he walks a short distance with a stick. He's had falls, he's needing help. He's continent in the day, but not at night. He's got vascular dementia, poor cognitive function, and he's sometimes aggressive. How many months do you think he will survive for? Just off the uh, just off the top of your head, six months, twelve months, twenty four months, forty eight months, or sixty months. This should be a quick and easy menti vote. So far, nine people have gone for it. Anybody else want to vote before I discuss? people. So two people think six months, one person thinks 12 months, you can read it as well as I can. And I have to say this is, all of you are probably right, he could survive for any of these lengths of time. And prognostication is incredibly difficult. And the challenge because of that is deciding when to stop preventative medicines is incredibly difficult. So Let's see if there's any better predictors out there, apart from all of us just going approximately. I did. I started by looking at the gold standards framework, which you probably know is about um, identifying people at risk of death. And they start with the surprise question. Uh, for people with advanced disease or progressive life limiting conditions, would you be surprised if the patient were to die in the next year or, or less? And we know um, yeah, I can come back to prioritising deep score. You can have all the slides, Kieran, at the end. Um, patients with a less than one year life expectancy are less likely to benefit from preventative treatments. You probably need to be at least a year on statins uh, before you're going to get benefit from them. But how easy is it to predict for frailty? So it's quite easy in some conditions and sadly like cancer, 
where there is a rapid predictable decline and a clearly predictable prognosis. It's harder and erratic and unpredictable in things like organ failure and really tricky in um, frailty, dementia and multimorbidity. You get a gradual decline, but how long is that going to last? And I already said it probably depends how good the car was in the first place and um, uh, other factors like good social support. So that's not easy, but I guess I wouldn't be sure this guy was going to die in the next year. Uh, so I couldn't really say that he uh, was going to sort of be immediately at the end of his life. The next thing I looked at was the o Office of National Statistics. So you can do this. I did my life expectancy calculation and at the moment it's 87. So I'm hoping it might be longer than that. And I put this man in, 87 year old male, and he's got an average life expectancy of 92 years. And this doesn't take any morbidity into account. Uh, he's 87, so he could live for five years. And he's got a 4% chance of making it to 100, although we don't really think that for this demented patient. So I think that this was the most useful thing I found, which was a USA site. So there's that caveat. It's a mortality risk calculator for community developing dwelling older adults with dementia. I did put the um, site in your resource pack and it tells you the predicted probability of death. So he's got a 50 percent chance of um, making it to two years. So that was our uh, favourite score on the mentee uh, of two years. We thought about two years. So we were about about 50 percent. We're about right. But he's still got nine. Um, 10% uh, chance of making it to five years. So we can't say he's in the last year of his life, although he might be. And that makes it really tricky when we're getting on to his preventative meds. Um, so, Chadney, shall I stop? No, you're okay to continue, Emma. It's fine. Carry on. Okay. So I'll carry on a bit longer, but I'll try not to keep you all day. Um, so it makes it tricky because... Um, we have a guy who's on preventative treatment. He might only last a year, but he might live for five years. And would it, would it be to his advantage or not to be on preventative drugs? One thing we can just check in with ourselves about is, is this primary or secondary prevention? So people sometimes are put on aspirin and statins. They've never had an event. Um, and uh, those people are potentially less likely to benefit from the drugs. Whereas if people have had events like our patient who's got vascular dementia, um, this is secondary prevention and potentially, you know, he's more at risk of um, cerebrovascular disease and therefore is more likely to benefit from prevention. So where drugs are for secondary prevention, continuing them is probably feels more important. We then got to think of the benefits and harms. And we know that frail patients are really a very low evidence zone when it comes to deciding whether we should prescribe preventative medicines or not. So I tried to pull out what evidence I could find from the literature for you to help us decide what to do when people are frail with some of their drugs. We know that with elderly patients, we have a more relaxed blood pressure target for blood pressure control. And this uh, study from Circulation Research attempted attempts from America again to provide some kind of an idea of how we should manage patients who are frail. So that's this lot, loss of function and altered ADLs um, and potentially limited life expectancy. What should we do? And this seems quite sensible to me. If we're going to do antihypertensive treatment, um, one drug, low doses, go slow keeping the systolic below 150. There's some evidence in frail patients that if you get your blood pressure too low and you're frail, uh, there's an increased risk of morbidity and mortality, especially if you're on antihypertensive medicines. And that might be because of watershed infarcts of the brain, if the um, brain is not perfused properly, falls, other things. So try not to use more than three antihypertensives. Uh, reduce treatment if the blood pressure is low or if they have orthostatic hypertension postural drop. So more relaxation around the blood pressure targets, but probably continue his meds because he does have vascular dementia and it's for secondary prevention. What about statins in elderly patients? Well, the evidence really suggests to continue, even though that's a bit of a trial um, 
uh, trial free area. So I tried to show you uh, some of the evidence for continuing versus stopping. This is a population study. Um, again, I've put all the references in the pack, but this suggests that the hazard ratio for death on statins in over 85s is 0.54. And this taken together, these numbers mean that people over 85 on statins are less likely to die than people not on statins over 85. This is a clinical trials. And again, I think there's something, a huge number of patients, but again, not very many of them are over 75. But again, the rate of cardiovascular events is less uh, in people on statins in trials uh, than people not on, on, on placebo over 75 years. So it suggests there's still benefit over uh, in elderly patients. And stopping them, this Danish cohort study, showed that if you were over 75 and you stop your statins, you are at increased risk of a major adverse cardiac event. And I put here the number needed to harm. If it was for primary prevention, you had to stop at statins for 112 over 75s to cause a cardiovascular event. Whereas if they were for secondary prevention, like our patient, you had to stop statins in 77 patients to cause a major event. And then finally, there's one retrospective study really in about, I can't remember, uh, tens of patients that didn't find any increase in one year mortality in the over 80s stopping statins. But remember, the benefits of statins probably, you probably need to be on them for at least a year to see benefits. So the suggestion is that probably we should continue. It seems statins probably have a low risk, risk of adverse burdens. Uh, um, adverse events, but we do, are aware that you, if you're frail, you get more adverse events. And this um, uh, is the, my final sli evidence slide for statins. This is a meta-analysis of statin, uh, fr statin use in frail patients now, suggesting that people on statins have a lower risk of all-cause mortality. But note, this crosses the line of no difference. So it's not proven to be better to be on statins than not if you're frail. And these are not clinical trials, they're small numbers. It's all cause mortality, which could include cancer and being run over by a car. So there are limitations. So probably, statins probably still work if you're gonna survive for at least two years. But uh, if you're overwhelmed by the burden of the medicine and the adverse effects, you could stop it. But it's not a priority to stop, I think. It's an easy one to stop because you don't see any difference in the patient when you stop it. And then finally, aspirin. It is the first line treatment for secondary prevention of cerebrovascular disease, which our patient has. It's worth noting that aspirin PK can be altered in the elderly. You get less esterase and you get less efficacy of aspirin. And there is a risk of bleeding. So if we look at 70 year olds not on aspirin, 0.25% um, of them, one in 400 will have a bleed. Uh, GI bleed, um, nothing to do with aspirin. Whereas if you're 80 and you're on aspirin, that risk goes up to 5%. So there's no doubt it increases the risk of bleeding, but it is the first line treatment. So for all of these treatments, there is an increased risk of harm in frail patients and still some evidence of benefit. It's quite tricky to know what to do. So at the moment, um, I think probably we should continue these drugs in this patient, but if his prognosis gets worse, we might then start to reduce his treatment burden, particularly, for example, if he can't swallow or he's um, falling. We've talked throughout about holistic and patient focused care, and I'm skipping over this, but obviously we need to negotiate all of this with the patient and his wife um, and his family, uh, particularly things like zopiclone and risperidone reduction. And so what I suggested we did, this is my suggestion, um, we're gonna stop his oxybutynin, we're gonna reduce his codeine, we're going to stop his zopiclone and risperidone if we can negotiate that with his wife and him. And for his preventative medicine, for now, let's carry on. But he has got urinary incontinence, so we could stop his bendaflumathiazide, which will have no benefit with the amlodipine, uh, because those two drugs together have the same mechanism of action, so they don't have any additive benefit in hypertension. But we might, for example, if contraindications allow, uh, give him uh, ramipril um, 
uh, to control his blood pressure. But again, we would. I, I'm not going to talk about the treatment for blood pressure because it will depend what is his blood pressure, has he got a postural drop, but Ramipril might be an alternative with the amlodipine. Um, so this uh, was the question that Kieran asked, is could he see the deprescribing prioritising again? Here it is. And I want to use this just to emphasise that we should um, uh, implement a discontinuation regime. When we've implemented the discontinuation regime, we need to monitor patients closely. Uh, and maybe we might have to go back on the drugs we hoped we'd stopped. And maybe um, we might uh, see an improvement, which we can then use to encourage further deprescribing. So I'm going to summarise and then we can answer the questions. Frailty is a multi-system syndrome of decreased physiological reserve, a bit like my old car. It's often associated with multimorbidity, polypharmacy, disability, but not universally. And medication in patients who are frail is often less effective than physical and social support. We can still prescribe medicines for disease and symptom control and for secondary disease prevention, I would say, rather than primary and frailty. But medicines may be less likely to be effective and more likely to be harmful. And so regular medication uh, review, which we all do, and deprescribing of medications which are likely to do more harm than good should be performed in frail patients, particularly medicines that worsen geriatric syndromes like the anticholinergic drugs. And shared decision making with patients and carers, as you've all emphasised, is essential in what is really an evidence light area. And then um, just to say I've made you a resource list if you want to use any of the tools that I've shown you. Uh, there's a SPSS article on managing cardiovascular risk in frail elderly, which looked helpful. And if you want to look at any of the references, I've made a reference list. So with that, I shall stop. Sorry that was so long. Um, no, not at all. I think it was uh, really informative. Thank you so, so much. Shall I answer um, Danielle's do. question? So I wouldn't. So my personal preference as someone who worked in a hypertension clinic for a long time is to use smaller doses of more than one drug. Mm. So you suggested increasing amlodipine first to 10 milligrams. So no. Uh, or switching it to ramipril. So he's very elderly. He's likely to have low renin hypertension. So ACE inhibitors alone are unlikely to be effective. So the first line drug will be a calcium channel blocker and or, um, I mean, a diuretic will do the same thing, but we've said we don't really want him on a diuretic. Um, I don't really think increasing his amlodipine is the right thing to do because I think that increases the risk of adverse effects. My preference would be to add a low dose ACE inhibitor rather than increase the dose of the amlodipine or change to an ACE inhibitor for those reasons. So that was an easy question, Danielle. If you've got any more things you want to add or ask, feel free to fire away. But I'm going to go to Ragad's question, which is what would we give instead of Zopiclone to aid sleep? And I don't know. I'm not, a, unfortunately, not a sleep doctor. And I think most medicines don't work. So I would suggest that he needs maybe more distraction, entertainment, a bit more activity to make him tireder, make sure he's not napping in the day. Um, it may not be there's anything we can do to aid his sleep that's easy because sleep is so I would perhaps involve a geriatrician or a sleep expert. But we've already heard from Lillian, I think it was, that uh, she had an 82 year old frail patient who nothing had worked and she'd been to sleep clinic, etc. So I don't think sleep is very easy to solve, but sometimes just giving drugs is giving nothing is often better than giving drugs, I think. I was going to suggest so something that someone's written is CMHT tend to type melatonin because that diminishes over time as we mature and is licensed for short term for the up to 13 weeks for uh, insomnia in itself. So that could be potentially an issue, but then you want to try taking them off it. So it's still blind leading the blind on that front with trying to get that person off the medicine long term on that front. Anything you would do, Hala? I think that just as Emma and you said about sleep, it, it, it's not an easy thing to, to crack. It depends. There's multifactorial, definitely sleep hygiene, being more active, um, even mentally challenged, you know, where, where, where they, they feel like they are, they exist and, and they are doing something with their life rather than just sleeping it off. 
um, always explore other options. Go for the smallest minimum effective dose for anything that you give. Try to stay away from the Z drugs as much as possible. And I think now the thing, so there was another comment I think that uh, Poonam had made uh, about Dari Dorexorant, uh, which is still a hypnotic um, from what I'm aware on that front. Um, but I don't know enough about it to be actively recommending to prescribe it, if that makes sense. Um, still works as a hypnotic. There's still going to be those same similar risks, I would presume, on that front, as you would with the risk of falls, the risk of going and having um, the difference with kind of uh, blood pressure I would assume as well I don't know about ACB burden because I haven't looked into it as much on that front but I think that is definitely something that we could look into and see if we know a bit more about have you heard about this at all Emma no I haven't and I would just continue to say that the probably the sleep is difficult to treat drugs will always have side effects Zopiclone and the Z drugs was heralded as the new safe benzodiazepines because they have short half-life they're said to have less hangover effect but they basically have very similar adverse effects to benzodiazepines so I would be cautious but this poor lady who's been crying because she's had in the wit's end these sorts of patients with really difficult intractable somnia, insomnia, maybe new drugs might be helpful. Uh, it sounds like it'd be a really good idea to get a sleep person to come and talk to you at one of your next sessions and let me know and I can come and listen. Absolutely. I think that might be someone I get to go and talk to and say, can we have a chat on this one, please? Um, funnily enough, looking at just, I just popped on to NICE because I thought it'd be just interesting to go and see a NICE, but it's the same sort of recommendations that treatment should be as short as possible. So similar to like we would say for the melatonin on that front and be assessed at three months uh, of starting and should be stopped in people whose long-term uh, insomnia may not have responded. If treatment is continued, should be assessed at regular intervals and stopped at earliest, at, uh, earliest opportunity. So I think it's a bit like with everything, to be honest, that you have one of those things we've got to go and just consider and reduce down and stop as we can. But I will see if I can find out more about this lovely drug uh, and more from potentially the company and see if they can come and tell us a bit more about it on that front. And apologies, Emma, I had to run to the toilet when you call, when you called about me, so I'm really sorry. It's all right, Hala helped me, so it was fine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Any other questions from anyone else? whilst we have our lovely Dr Baker on the phone. Just to say, if you have any difficult patients, don't forget the monthly polypharmacy MDT, bring them along, any questions or queries, and um, or send your patients to our clinic if you're, if you're having problems with de-prescribing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Emma. I think that's been really informative, really helpful. And I think especially with people still trying to get into grips, I love the analogy of the older car or more mature car, as I like to put it, as ever um, on that front. But I think that's a great way of putting it. That Actually, it may well be that it's still functioning, still very well functioning, but just not at its 100 percent as it was when it was brand new. Um, and and the risk is that if test. something. If something disrupts it, it will crash. That's the yeah. problem. Absolutely. And I think that's a great analogy to have on that front. And I think that's going to be a great way that I'm going to explain to patients going forward as well. Um, I tend to go and say that we're like uh, with heart failure, to be honest, that the heart's just not working as effectively. It hasn't packed up and hasn't failed. But I tend to say it's just not working as effectively. But I might use the car analogy now going forward. Amazing. Mm -hmm. We've not had any other questions come through. So I think that's been a very successful talk, Dr. Baker. Um, Thank you, everyone, for participating in the Mentimeter. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll Thanks see you then. soon. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. And now we return to the original Minty. She says, if I can find it, um, after closing the other Minty that I had on that front. <laughs> 